Uh, hello, good evening, and welcome to the fifth uh, fifth Better AI Meetup. Uh, this time, we will be talking about cybersecurity and explainability of AI. But first, I would like to welcome you very warmly. We have almost full audience, which is for the first time. And I have to say we have almost an anniversary because we've started uh, December last year. And so it's time to almost celebrate. Almost because, yeah, it's not one year full. So we still have some time to wait. Also, also it's almost because five is the first number to round up to 10. And 10 is the time to celebrate. And, uh, you know, it's almost a celebration because we have no alcohol to celebrate. So sorry for that. Uh, but uh, don't worry, there will be a lot of fun. Uh, I would like to ask you to post your questions uh, in Slido, where, where you are watching. Uh, we have a channel that's uh, hashtag better underscore AI. You can post any questions. We will be answering them right after the presentation or at the end at the QA. Don't worry, we try to answer all the questions. And uh, I would like to... Uh, thank our partners that make this happen, and that's uh, HubHub. It's the place where we are currently staying. Uh, Kinit, uh, one of them will be presenting about explainability of AI. Uh, Innovatrix, it's me, and uh, Tatra Banka. Uh, and um, without you know further ado, I would like to welcome uh, Jura Janosik who, despite his name, is actually one of the good guys, and he will be talking about how they use AI in cybersecurity. You're right, please. It's yeah, yours. Thank you. So, uh, hello, everyone. Uh, so, my name is uh, Juraj Janosik. Uh, I'm a uh, principal machine learning engineer, but I'm more of a uh, leader of a part of core research and development uh, in ESET, responsible for incorporating machine learning approaches, automation, into the threat detection. So that's, that is what we will be talking about today. Uh, let me start quickly uh, with some terminology that we use in uh, using ESET, how we understand uh, artificial, intelligent, artificial intelligence. So uh, we understand it more of a general concept when an intelligent machine uh, can learn and make decision independently based on the input from the environment uh, without uh, and without any human supervision, and uh, from this definition, I still think that the AI is something uh, in the realm of cybersecurity, uh, <laughs> science fiction. Uh, however, what we use right now is uh, machine learning. So, machine learning, a technology, uh, probably don't need to tell you more about, uh, that is able to uh, give machines the ability to find. Uh, patterns in the vast amount of data. So, uh, but when we really want to know uh, what, what is the state of some technology, let's look at the, let's look at the jokes. Uh, and I think this is uh, precisely the true. Uh, when it's something written in Python, typically everybody said that it's machine learning. Immediately when it gets to, uh, to PowerPoint, well, we have AI. Uh, so while well, we started uh, in 1950s, uh, machine learning technology was, uh, was introduced, uh, then in 2000, uh, it looks more like this. Like still, a uh, uh, lot of a lot of ma a lot of mathematical concepts. Uh, and uh, typically, when you want to do something with machine learning in those times, you need to write everything from scratch and from your on your own, uh, and looking at the uh, at the papers and. And so right now, what we have, this fancy stuff like TensorFlow, a lot of other, lot of frameworks, uh, frameworks which are, which are here, to, uh, here to help. Even you don't need to understand any, any machine learning, and actually, you can do that. Uh, so machine learning and artificial intelligence is everywhere around us. It's uh, transforming our lives, impacting our lives, influencing, improving our lives every day. Uh, there are many areas of scientific research uh, and it's hard to keep the pro hard to keep uh, to keep up, and many uh, many of these machine learning technologies um, made it made it uh, made it mainstream already and have become uh, indispensable. No, not uh, not everyone necessarily needs to understand it. Uh, however, uh, as a useful these tools these, these machine learning uh, is. Uh, equally can be used by the bad guys, and it is used by the bad guys. There is no limitations how you can how you can use these technologies in a in a bad way, and I think it will be happening more in the future. 
uh, when, in the, when we look at the cybersecurity uh, realm, and the situation there with these technologies is even more complicated. Uh, there is a bunch of a bunch of vendors, uh, cybersecurity solution vendors that we like to like to call them uh, post truth. Uh, they they really claim that machine learning is something like a silver bullet that will solve all the problems in the in the cybersecurity. Then that you don't need to. Then, then you don't need to update your stuff, update your models. You don't need to unpack anything or or deobfuscate, emulate, and and so on. Um, well, we dare to oppose these claims. Uh, we think that our experience and reputation as an ESET uh, make us competent to say that machine learning based models in cybersecurity needs to be updated, needs to be retrained, needs to be accompanied also with other cybersecurity defense techniques. You can't just rely on one. Uh, one solution. So, yeah, typically these vendors uh, spread these stories full of magic. Um, let's look quickly on our technology, how we evolved. Uh, so, uh, since the time of ESET started as a garage company uh, after the breakup of the uh, uh, Iron Curtain, uh, well, uh, the company started itself 30 years ago uh, and even in the times, the, the, the founders of the company played with, with algorithms that have been uh, driven by, uh, by machine learning ideas. Uh, first way, uh, well, actually in 1998, we were the, one of the first companies that actually used uh, neural networks in the product. So everybody who was uh, buying our products already had it in the detection, uh, in the detection core later. Through the years, uh, we used uh, we used a bunch of other 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 technologies that that are uh, supposed to automate stuff. Use use some clustering, uh, use these online learning capabilities, and so on for for various things. And later in 2017, we tried to combine everything together and start with some systematic approach that our clients could benefit from. Uh, well, from the beginning of the asset, as I said, as the garage company, and uh, we have been low co compared to our competitors. The amount of the employees that we have was was uh, uncomparable. So we rather try to approach cybersecurity more intelligently, uh, and rather than using brute force, which a lot of other uh, competitors have been have been doing. And this this situation like pushes toward uh, more more incorporating of more automation and. Yeah, hence machine learning approaches, collecting data, processing them, uh, and trying to uh, trying to um, find the needle in the haystack uh, with the less people that we have. Um, okay, so years ago, uh, limitations in utilizing machine learning uh, as we as we see them uh, see them now was typically the huge cost of the specified hardware, and of course the load. Uh, on the software engineers that need to prepare everything because uh, the tools were basically not available. Uh, but this changed significantly uh, in the last decade. Uh, with the boom of the big data, you have a bunch, uh, bunch of nice technologies that, could, uh, uh, that, that your further uh, models can benefit from because uh, uh, you can easily uh, work with uh, huge loads of data. Cost of the hardware went down, mainly mainly GPUs, which are absolutely crucial. Um, and uh, yeah, that's that's where we are nowadays. And and for us, uh, we are investing a lot in these uh, in these technologies. We are trying to leverage as much uh, as much approaches as possible. Try what is working, what is not, and yeah, hence delivering uh, this uh, to our clients. Other thing is the uh, machine learning algorithms itself. Uh, are on the rise. The academic papers are pushed uh, uh, out every day, uh, new innovative ways and so on. Yeah, we are keeping keeping eye on it, try uh, new things that are available, uh, new frameworks and so on. So, um, just the, the, the idea is the this, this new, uh, new way how this whole area is, uh, uh, is evolving is for us is an opportunity uh, to kind of identify the things that work and those uh, which not. Um, funny thing, we found that some algorithms are not good for, uh, for, for detection of the, of the malicious code, but, but they are great for predicting lunch, uh, uh, what, will, what will people order for lunch in our, in our lab. Um, well, 
uh, and uh, one of the most crucial things that a lot of people uh, a lot of people care less about or don't think of it uh, when when speaking about building machine learning models is the understanding of the data. Uh, well, uh, our database co contains hundreds of terabytes of, of samples, uh, binary sam uh, binaries, uh, uh, scripts, whatever, clean and malicious. But the important thing is to understand what is inside, uh, to have it uh, correctly labeled, and uh, this is the real advantage. The, and uh, and also, of course, the human uh, human understanding of the data, the the, the domain knowledge of the guys. Uh, in our lab, which are doing the detection, the analysis, and so on. So the timely, real-world data, correct labels of those uh, data, the domain understanding, uh, and the malware research, those are the things that, that drives the accuracy uh, in our case. The, the, the things that allow us to create the well-performing uh, models. So uh, as, I, as I mentioned before, this, uh, this uh, post-truth uh, Cybersecurity, cybersecurity vendors, they usually claim that the machine learning is a silver bullet that will solve everything. Uh, well, this is a, this is a myth. Uh, after 30 years uh, that we are doing, uh, doing this as a company, uh, we saw that not even with the newest machine learning algorithms you can achieve this. So uh, what's, uh, what's the other thing that, uh, that uh, a lot of, a lot of uh, like vendors which say that they are like next gen uh, is that the math can solve everything. Well, uh, look at look at the work of Alan Turing uh, during the during the times of breaking Enigma. Uh, he said that even a flawless machine uh, wouldn't always be able uh, just uh, just uh, based on the unknown input wouldn't be able to decide whether uh, whether this would lead to unwanted behavior. And that's that's basically the case. If you don't. Uh, don't have all the understanding. You can't just predict something uh, that will uh, some, uh, somebody do, and especially in the in the cybersecurity. So, another claim that these guys typically use is that okay, so we don't have, uh, machine learning is not enough. So let's let's uh, use deep learning. However, this is the same. Uh, like whether you use a deep learning algorithm or a regular machine learning algorithm is just like putting everything in one basket on one one algorithm. Yes, different one, but uh, it will it will not change anything. Another thing that I mentioned already uh, is the is the data set. So if you have like uh, Lack of understanding of the data sets you, you build uh, you build them incorrectly. Well, you end up with a buggy model, which is which might cause a lot of lot of issues for the clients. Either uh, missing some detection or creating a lot of lot of FPs, um, false positives. So marking something uh, benign, clean as 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 malicious. So another thing, uh, artificial in uh, artificial intelligence or machine learning is great. Uh, for some environments, like uh, typically, uh, a, uh, a typical argument is that, oh, look at this algorithm. He's able to play chess and go and beat every uh, beat every every human pe player. But in cybersecurity, the situation is a bit different um, because the the bad guys do not hesitate to break the rules, bend the rules, or or actually uh, the environment is changing so fast that that it doesn't have like. Uh, 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 Precise, precise rules. So, this doesn't uh, this doesn't apply uh, here. Another thing, uh, really important, is the false positive. So, uh, obviously, on this picture, you can say that this is a false positive, right? Uh, so, cyber criminals also work hard to create a a, um, a software code, use their skills uh, to avoid being detected. But uh, a lot of people is uh, less less thinking about the false positives. So, and this is typical for machine learning algorithms. Uh, there are false positives, uh, typically a lot, uh, especially if they are if they are buggy. But imagine the situation in a huge company with the with the tens or hundreds of sometimes the thousands uh, of false alarms every day. Uh, typically, uh, it, might, uh, it might cause the administrators to lower down the settings, so it might, it might lose, some, lose some, some things being detected, or, uh, or even the load on the, on the stuff that needs to deal with it uh, is huge. So uh, false positives are, are really a problem, and especially uh, with the machine learning. And yeah, as in, as in real life, 
uh, when you think you are pregnant, you probably double check, right? So, and this, this same is here, like in cybersecurity, you can't just rely on one, one solution and uh, rather, rather combine them, even, even combine machine learning technologies like, like different algorithms, but still to make a resilient solution, uh, use also other layers. And this is basically what we are doing. So uh, this here, it's, uh, it's really simple uh, show, uh, showcase of how our endpoint security works. This is like on every computer, every server, mobile phone, everything that the asset, is, uh, asset is protecting. So there is like several layers which are interconnected uh, and uh, every is specified in, in some uh, some concrete area, and a lot of them actually have uh, machine learning built inside. Uh, so let's start uh, with the DNA detections. Uh, formerly, something uh, maybe you know it. It's uh, it's really really known uh, in uh, in in cybersecurity detection. It's uh, called signatures. So signatures means that you just mark some specific uh, specific object file binary or, or script that this is this is a malicious. Typically, with using of some hash. Uh, well, in ESET we came a long time with an idea that rather uh, we look on the behavior. So what is actually happening in this, our DNA detection is that we have a binary or script and we transform it into a form which is more amenable um, to, to matching, comparing and detection. And uh, we pick uh, some, uh, some part of these DNAs, these, these genes, and create the DNA detections. We have this uh, since like 2005, and it's still devel developed and used uh, in also in other ways. But these detections together uh, are uh, are combined into one huge model, which is uh, uh, which is uh, regularly updated. Uh, these detections are created either automatically or by human engineers and distributed to the clients like uh, every couple of. Uh, every couple of minutes. Uh, yeah, you can say that basically this is some kind of statistic and I just said that, okay, this is a machine learning, but who doesn't it? Uh, but, but yeah, it's, uh, uh, in today's terms, uh, it, could be, it could be said that it's, uh, that it's online, online machine learning approach. So how it, uh, how it actually performs? Uh, what we have here, uh, it's a Qbot, uh, Qbot attacks uh, over the course of two years. Um, uh, this is uh, the Qbot is like very, uh, very, uh, um, a very popular uh, Trojan, uh, which is uh, fo uh, focused on collecting user user data, credentials, and so on. And uh, uh, we see that uh, during the course of two years, we have seen like 130,000 uh, unique Qbot detections, and uh, like the pink or Violet uh, of, uh, colored uh, part uh, is uh, is was detected just by just one DNA detection. So we can see that this approach actually works pretty nicely. So one DNA detection that was created somewhere in uh, 2019 was still able to protect clients uh, two years uh, two years later. Um, okay, so maybe something uh, some some other. Showcase. This is uh, this is detection of of TrickBot. Uh, again, similar uh, similar uh, type of type of malware, which is collecting collecting user credentials and so on. And uh, what we have seen recently, uh, after the um, war in the Ukraine broke out, uh, the group behind this uh, is very unfamous part of uh, uh, part of GRU. Uh, the military intelligence in uh, in Russia, uh, and the group is called Conti, and uh, the they chat uh, the chat of the group completely leaked because there were some people in the group who were withdrawn from the Ukraine, and after the war, uh, somebody had a great idea to put everything public. So we access uh, we access all the all the chats and all the data, and what we have seen there have been a lot of discussion about this detection. Like they said that others are not that scary. Like on the top of the of the chat was uh, like the discussion about other security vendors that oh that's not that not that important like let's try to avoid this detection so yeah those are bad guys but actually they give us some credit uh, okay so other part uh, of the uh, endpoint protection which I showed uh, that's a machine learning uh, advanced machine learning module which is a part of every 
uh, is distributed on every uh, every machine that we are protecting, every server, every mobile phone, laptop, everything, and is updated uh, regularly. So how it works? Uh, the thing that I showed before, these DNAs uh, and those genes are used as a features. So uh, based on that and all our data, we trained models. It's a combination of various approaches, deep learning algorithms, and uh, various other uh, extremely boosted trees and so on. Like a couple of algorithms that we find out that, that worked uh, in a way that is, uh, uh, that is uh, doing what we want, like uh, uh, detection. And uh, all these uh, outputs from, this, from these models are combi combined in something what we call consolidation is other small neural network, which, which basically uh, spits out the information if something uh, on the input, which is typically some binary, uh, is malicious, potentially unwanted, or, or clean. And this part, uh, this one is really small, and is updated almost, uh, almost every couple of days. Okay, but uh, we also have parts in cloud, which are much more complex, much more uh, complicated, uh, are, which are combining uh, various other methods, uh, there we have also machine learning algorithms, but much more huge, which couldn't be distributed to the clients. Uh, which, are, for example, a couple of gigabytes, because typically uh, users don't want to have uh, don't want to have uh, security software which has like 10 gigabytes on your uh, on your on your laptop. But are also combining different different layers like uh, sandboxing and so on. Uh, well. What I also want to say is that uh, I mentioned that some of the some of the models and algorithms are are uh, pushed to the clients, like to every every device. Uh, thing is that what we see here uh, is like uh, everybody is comparing uh, their models, like how many how many parameters is there, who have more. Like uh, yeah, we have uh, like switch from from Google, we have several billions of parameters and so on. Our models are somewhere here. So yes, uh, even with a small model, you can do a pre uh, you can do a lot of good job. Uh, the wh why is our model small? Is precisely because we we need to uh, have them distributed to all of our clients, uh, and uh, and uh, doing this this is like really really challenging. Uh, and yeah, somebody tell you like okay, so let's let's do a bigger models so like why, why why not? Yeah, we have them in the cloud, but you. Uh, but this is the thing that uh, not everybody is willing to send the data over to the cloud, especially in terms of the cybersecurity. So that's why we are also uh, building models that are distributed and can can be distributed to a huge amount of clients, especially some specific. Okay, so maybe uh, just a quickly how we are leveraging supervised technologies uh, because I before uh, was talking mainly about. Um, Supervised learning. So, for example, uh, it's uh, it's good for processing some really uh, really specific uh, types of of binaries. In this case, it was the UFIs, which is the successor of the BIOS. Uh, and uh, believe it or not, it's pretty uh, pretty heavily used for as an attack surface. Uh, we were actually the first company that. Uh, that uh, was having a technology to identify malicious software in this uh, in this part of uh, uh, part of computer, and we discovered thanks to these technologies, to, to unsupervised learning processing of the huge data and so on, uh, the first uh, malware which was residing in the rootkit. It was from the Sednit group again, another part of uh, a Russian Russian military operation, and it was targeting um, uh, high profile. Uh, High-profile targets like uh, government officials and um, journalists. Okay, so this is basically our complete uh, complete uh, protection ecosystem, combining a lot of other stuff. I don't want to go into the detail, but uh, there are also other places where we are trying to leverage automation and, and machine learning technologies to basically alleviate the stuff that needs to be processed by humans. Okay, so I was I was talking mainly about how uh, machine learning is used is in used in the for the good in the cybersec, but uh, well, also bad guys could use it, and uh, cyber uh, cyber attackers can and are utilizing machine learning technologies to their own benefit. So basically, uh, maybe all of you saw it: uh, fa deep fakes. 
yeah, uh, the deepfake for with uh, with Zelensky was a little bit clumsy, but let's say that people which are not that um, and not that critically thinking could could fall for it. Uh, then a uh, few years back, uh, some group of uh, researchers was able successfully with the, uh, with using of the image generation technology break the the face ID uh, protection of the iPhones. Then we have uh, we have another like GPT-3 used for generating uh, fake news, and it was uh, pretty interesting research because a lot of people actually think that it was true. Uh, then we have improvements in spear phishing. These are like targeted campaigns, and uh, the advances in the in the in the, tra in the in the translation and also in these uh, algorithms like like GPT are used to build a pretty uh, pretty good uh, phishing emails, which are really hard to distinguish and even harder to detect. Okay, so what are the possible possible uh, uses uh, of machine learning in the future. Like typically, what is happening also also right now is like uh, the bad guys are trying to create as much as possible new malicious software and, and distribute it uh, by uh, by using automation, leveraging machine learning. They, they can generate a vast amount of it and basically just uh, through everything what they have on us. Currently, we are processing like hundreds of thousands of samples every day, unique. So it's, it's a tremendous amount and, and the number is still rising. Thanks to also these technologies. Uh, creation of, of malicious spam emails, spear phishing and so on, I already mentioned it. Uh, and, uh, and also uh, there are other, other ways how to, how to leverage uh, machine learning. Uh, for the bad guys, for example, protecting uh, infecting nodes in the in the infrastructure. Uh, so basically, what we are doing, but on their side, like for example, in the botnet. Uh, also, improve the self-destruct mechanism. So they, they try to identify if somebody uh, is actually trying to identify their activity in the botnet, and then, uh, for example, uh, presenting them a different uh, or misleading misleading information, or totally uh, uh, totally give up the activity. Also, creating false flags or uh, mimic some patterns of legitimate uh, network traffic uh, in the victim's network to, to conceal the malicious, uh, malicious activity and so on. Uh, looking at some, some real-world example, uh, we have been part of a group uh, of law enforcement and, and uh, private sector cybersecurity vendors which are trying to take down the Emotet, which was one of the biggest uh, biggest botnets and uh, biggest uh, biggest uh, cyber attack operations in in the last couple of years. Uh, it was very complicated. Uh, their their emotet was elusive. It was a catamount game and so on. And we actually believe from the data that we that we saw and from the research that they might probably use some machine learning technologies to avoid uh, not only being detected but actually to be researched. Like uh, we are actively trying to put. Uh, some uh, some honeypots and, and decoys in in the in their botnet and to to watch for the activities uh, and they always uh, actually identified us and this is what actually uh, Ukrainian police found out in those in those apartments of the guys so we thought that they have like pretty uh, pretty decent infrastructure but actually uh, they have this on the right side uh, so typically things doesn't need to seem. Uh, as we as we as we thought, uh, okay. So other th other things uh, where we see uh, machine learning being used by the bad guys is the increased speed of attack, uh, improving uh, malware targeting. So basically, just by collecting uh, the publicly available data, uh, you are able to better uh, better target uh, your victims. And what is what is one of the like most important thing? Uh, in in uh, in cybersec and is one of the most uh, most precious are the zero days. So you find you identify a vulnerability in a software that will that that could take them like a uh, whole company. Uh, and for this purpose, typically developers use something which is called fuzzing. So we will have like a compiled code for which you don't have a source code. And by these technologies, you are able to 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 find. Uh, Identify the vulnerability and based on that maybe build some some exploit and uh, currently uh, Microsoft and Google uh, have projects which are publicly available to do this to automate this using 
uh, using an AI. And they say that they have been able to identify over 20,000 vulnerabilities just uh, using, this, using this technology. Well, there is nothing that will stop the bad guys to do the same, right? Because the tools are already there. So uh, we will see how it will when, when in the future, but uh, it will be definitely not good. Uh, okay, the last thing I want to mention is the IoT, the Internet of Things, the realm of these, uh, of these devices like uh, security cameras, intelligent uh, heating, and so on. Uh, basically, this is like bringing the old bugs uh, to new. Uh, there have been a bunch of, bunch of zero days and vulnerabilities uh, which uh, have been already solved in the computers years back. Uh, and and uh, these, these devices are... Everything is co connected to the internet. There is a lot of like a um, uh, lot of data uh, which have like sensitive uh, characteristic, and uh, there are groups which are leveraging uh, leveraging and actually starting the the huge attacks using this using the leveraging machine learning technologies and automation and so on. Um, uh, you can you can build nicely. Uh, you can train models based on the leaked passwords to to actually uh, accelerate uh, cracking like a uh, uh, bunch of a bunch of devices over the over the internet. So yeah, the the situation here is even more uh, more complicated. Um, and even you don't need to use any machine learning to build a uh, a decent decent botnet. For example, mostly botnet, which is one of the uh, one of the most uh, uh, most uh, uh, prevalent one uh, in the routers and security cameras and so on. Already the actors have been catched by the police. The, 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 the botnet itself is like that. However, uh, it was written in such a clever way that it's still spreading, still attacking new devices. It's carrying uh, a pretty nice algorithm of uh, cracking passwords and so on. So it's still causing problem even though the, the operators are already in jail. So let's look at the quickly at the future. So uh, artificial, well, meticulous research said this year that uh, almost half of all instances, uh, oh, sorry, the artificial intelligence in the in the cybersecurity market is like pretty pretty nice number. And uh, by the end of this decade, it will be it will be definitely more. Uh, machine learning and AI are expected to produce uh, like great financial and surely a security value. So there will be a lot of a uh, lot of vendors which will try to get their piece uh, from this cake, uh, but not all outlook are that that grim. Like half of all AI applications uh, right now seems to be uh, somehow connected with the cybersecurity. Uh, actually, uh, this is this is this is I think a, a, a good thing. Uh, I'm still still kind of a um, uh, skeptic, but. What we need to do is ask the vendors uh, what they offer, uh, like if their algorithms are effective, how they build them, how they train them, how they test them, and so on. So actually, we need to grill them, the vendors, you can grill us as an ESET, uh, all about these questions, like how we do that, and if actually our solution is bringing uh, the good to the clients. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. You're right. There are some questions for you. I, I will. Can you just can you just wait for a minute? Uh, we will we will have at least some some answer, and then we will leave to. Actually, you ended up on a nice note because the next part will be about explainable AI, which is definitely uh, giving answers to the questions that you put in. So um, we have a question from here. But first, uh, is there anybody in the audience who wants to ask like a real live question? If yes, we have two microphones over here. Okay. So, yes, yeah, so we will start more shyly. Okay, we have question over here. Right. Uh, first of all, awesome presentation. Thanks Thank a lot. Uh, I have three questions, actually. The first mm -hmm. one is, what is the answer for your question, which you have actually in, in the topic of your presentations? What's the answer? Um, because in the... Uh, in the Where's the equilibrium, the cybersecurity equilibrium? <laughs> yes. So what's, what's the answer uh, here? Because... Uh, well, that's, <laughs> that's a good question. Uh, is the equilibrium well? Uh, we see that that uh, 
the the we need to we need to approach AI as uh, as a tool that could be used for good and for bad, uh, and especially in cybersecurity, that 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 will be causing problems. So uh, we just need to keep uh, keep thinking about it. That's that's I think my 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 answer to that. All right. Uh, so the second question you mentioned the. Uh, term false positives a couple of times. So, uh, how are you fighting the false positives exactly? So, what's 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 your approach for fighting false positives? Uh, it's uh, it's complex one. One uh, like we have uh, in terms of the machine learning technologies, we we try to build the test sets uh, and and test it against against like a lot of lot of clean stuff. Uh, uh, test it um, like in silent mode on the on the client side in the cloud and so on to collect as much data as possible. And then we see uh, like what are the ratios if it's if it's like enough or not. Uh, for some really like specific stuff, typically some highly packed and protected uh, protected uh, software, which is uh, which is typically getting being detected by this. Uh, by these approaches, or generally, is a problem for uh, for cybersec uh, software. Then you can you can use like whitelisting. Uh, you can we can we are looking for a reputation of the software, like how many people in our uh, in our like environment have the, have it if they're marked like like clean, and so on. So there is like a lot of lot of ways how to do it. You can, for example. You can't just rely on a uh, on a file signature. That's that's not enough. I mean, like, uh, uh, if if some executable is signed, uh, and also you can uh, you you might think that this uh, signature is like trusted. Uh, yeah, it's not a problem for for a signature which was uh, uh, which was um, uh, which is from Microsoft or Google, but uh, there is there is a lot of like different vendors. And uh, the problem is, uh, a lot of times the signatures get stolen. So we typically like combine everything, which as I mentioned, together like the reputation, whitelisting, uh, and also like in the DNA model, what we have is not only for the malicious stuff. We are also creating DNAs for the clean stuff to identify like if the software is somehow involving. So we are still able to, uh, for example, exclude some some new software which was modified still from the, from being detected. If it's like kind of a problematic, uh, problematic sample. Thank you. We still have one question over there, and don't don't forget your questions because there will be still a lot of time at the end. I just I just want to give a, I just want to give space to Martin as well. What? But uh, let's have another one. Since you're doing wonderful things uh, in your team, uh, could you tell us a bit more about who's behind it? That uh, tell us more about your team. How many people are there? Whether you have some. Mm -hmm. Specializations or some specialists in the team, etc. Yes, uh, the we have actually like a section. So there is like four teams uh, which are doing different different things. Not everything is like precisely machine learning, but there are like combinations uh, with some automation, uh, big data, and so on. Uh, there is like 30 people. Uh, for example, here is Philip, uh, one of my team leaders, which have a team which is like specifically uh, working on various uh, like machine learning approaches, not only in the stuff that I, that I mentioned, but also, for example, in XDR, which is uh, we are not we are not looking on the endpoint, but you're looking on the network, so that you have like more events and there are like much more challenging challenging stuff. So uh, yes, we have some people are specified in some areas. Uh, there are people which, which are like uh, uh, started their careers uh, as a as a detection engineers or machine learning analysts, and on the school there is they have been studying like machine learning or uh, some artificial intelligence, and they end up in our team. Thank, thank you, Uri. Uh you can see that this guy is brimming with information, so don't worry. We'll have it. We'll have him uh, in the second part uh, for our Q and A. But uh, let's leave the floor to Martin Uri. Thank you very yes. much, and I'm looking forward to more questions. Don't worry; these will not disappear, so and we will get to all of them. Thank you. Okay, so hi everyone. Today I'm going to talk about explainable AI and I really hope you are going to enjoy this topic. It is quite interesting. I'm going to cover several topics regarding explainable AI. And I also hope you will have plenty of questions with which we can discuss after this talk and during the whole evening. So let's get started. 
Uh, when someone mentions explainability, what usually comes to people's mind is something like, okay, so we want to explain decisions of machine learning models and maybe the knowledge content in the models themselves. This is undoubtedly uh, useful, but it is definitely not the only motivation behind why we want the AI to be explainable. Let's have an example. So we have a image classification task and we have two classifiers. One is based on Fisher vectors, one is CNN-based classifier. Uh, these classifiers classify images and these images contain things like boats, horses and natural objects. When we classify these two images, they are both correctly classified by both classifiers as boats. So that's okay. When we classify all the images in our input data, we find out that both models have approximately the same performance. So the important question here is, which of these models is likely to perform better in the wild after we deploy it? So what can we use to help us to decide which model to use in production? We can use additional metrics. For instance, if we evaluated the models in terms of accuracy, we can use additional metrics like F1 score, or we can look at the predictions for individual classes. Basically, we can extend our analysis of results. We can use an additional data. We collect new data and we evaluate these models on new unseen data to get more insights. We can roll the dice. It can be a valid option if these models are equivalent in terms of performance and there is no specific per preference for this or that kind of model, rolling the dice can be a valid option if we want to, for some reason, deploy only one model. But what we can do, we can look at it from different perspective. We can use explainable AI to get even more insights. Until now, the only thing that we got from the models was prediction. For these two images, from both models, we got the same prediction that it is a boat. But we can use explainability to get something like this. We can get heat maps like this, where individual values represent some kind of relevance of individual input features, in this case, pixels. And this relevance tells us how individual pixels influence the prediction of the model. And as you can see here from the heat maps, the models didn't behave the same. Frankly, I would consider uh, a suspicious towards this Fisher vector classifier as rightful. Why? because it seems that the Fisher vector classifier, at least for these two images, didn't that much uh, consider the pixels that belong to the boat itself, but it looked rather more on the pixels that belong to the water. So I'm suspicious that the Fisher vector made some hack, that it used a, a shortcut that if there is a water, well, I will classify it as a boat. We can make one additional step and we can create some average heat map. After we do this for all the training data, we will find out that, that this particular classifier mostly makes its decisions for the class boat based on the pixels that are located in the lower part of the images. What is in the lower part of such images? Well, water. So it seems that our suspicion was right and we successfully used explainable AI to pick the correct classifier for this uh, particular situation. Well, the explainable AI is quite a wide topic. In our research and also in this presentation, I'm going to concentrate more on postdoc explainability. In the first part of the presentation, I will provide some brief introduction of the generic topic of explainable AI. Since 2012, when all the revolution about deep learning and machine learning in, gen in general started, Deep learning and machine learning achieved unprecedented performance in almost any task and almost any domain. Besides data, the huge amount of data that we have, and besides the increased capacity, uh, computational capacity of hardware like GPUs and HPC, it was the ability of deep learning to model complex functions that allowed them to outperform humans in many individual tasks. Okay. This is a nice property, but because these models are complex, their decision-making process is complex, 
It also means, on the other hand, that understanding their, their decisions is complex as well. And this is the goal of the explainable AI. We want to preserve the performance of these complex models, but on the other hand, we want to increase their interpretability. We want to make these models less behave like black boxes, and we want to get more insights into them. Uh, over the last decade, since 2012, the explainability has become quite a hot topic. And what's the good news, this is not only about research, but it is also about industry. Here, from the research point of view, you can see how the number of publications which, is rela which are related to explainable and interpretable AI grew over time. These are Scopus publications. So research is quite clearly focused on explainable AI. And industry as well. Here you can see an example that Azure, which is backed up by Microsoft, one of the biggest players in the field, already provides services that support interpretability of the models. And it is not only about interpretability, but they also focus on interesting topics like fairness, combating biases, and so on. So it is both about research and industry. I have, until now, I have multiple times used words like explainability, explanations, and so on. So the rightful question is, what is actually explanation? And the answer is that there is not one single answer. Explanation is something, but this something has to be special. It has to be understandable to humans. Otherwise, the explanation wouldn't make much sense if humans couldn't understand them. And also, they should accurately or faithfully describe the underlying processes of the model. In other words, when we get an explanation, we should be able to understand it, and it shouldn't lie about how the model actually behaves. In this presentation and in our research, again, we focus mostly on explanations of predictions. Because when we talk about explanations of machine learning models, we can want to use explanation for different things. We could want to explain the knowledge contained in the model. We can want to use the explanations to, con to describe predictions, as I, as I said. So it is really a wide topic. There are two important questions that arise. How can we get explanations? And how this something, how these explanations can actually look like? So the first and maybe more intuitive way how to get explanations is like this. We can design models to not only provide the prediction, which is the typical way, but we can also want from the models to provide explanation as well. This can have different forms. This can be a text in natural language, so that the model directly tells me why the decision was like it was. It can be some kind of heat map, it can be anything. The second and to date more popular family of approaches is to use some sort of post hoc explainability technique, some explainability algorithm, to somehow extract the explanations from already existing black box model. OK, and how these explanations can actually look like? Uh, explanation can be evidence or example based. So what does it mean that we, from the model, we get some prediction for a single sample? This can be an image classification task, and this image was classified as mountain. So we can ask some explainability algorithm to give us some training samples that were used for training of the model, that were used to build some knowledge base in the model, and that are in some sense related to the model similar to our data point. It is, the similarity is not based on similarity of the images themselves, but for instance, on the activations that this sample and my sample caused inside the neural network. Another type of explanation we have already seen, it's those heat maps. What, what actually this heat map means is that for individual input features, in this case pixels, it tells me how individual pixels influence the prediction of the model. And just one important thing about relevance attribution, we usually connect them with some sort of heat maps. 
it con could be tempting to connect it only to some vision task like classification of images and so on, but it can be also easily used to text classification, for instance. In this case, we will, we will get relevance for individual, for individual words that we, for instance, put into our language models. There are many different other types, many different forms of explanations that we can get. And if you are interested in this topic, I would definitely recommend you to read this paper. It is quite extensive, but it very well covers the topic of explainable AI. Okay, so this was the introduction. And now let's move to a more recent topic of automated explainable AI. Well, today, from the perspective of machine learning, we live in quite happy times. For many different problems, it means combinations of task and data, we have not one, but many different machine learning and deep learning algorithms and their variations that we can use and achieve at least reasonable performance on this task and this data. But this wealth and this quantity of different models also introduces a challenge. We need to somehow select the right model for our task and data that will provide good performance. So, to find such model, we usually, in the first step, define the criteria. Some set of criteria that will allow us to compare different models and to pick the right one that provides best results for our task at hand. Once we have this criteria defined, well, we can, we can usually do some kind of hyperparameter optimization, or if we have resources for that, we can use some sort of automated machine learning. So, in fact, in recent years, the number of, of postdoc explainability methods became similarly overwhelming like the number of different models. You all, on, you all know that, that every day, as already Duro mentioned, every day there are new papers, new models are, are published, new architectures are published, and it is quite, it, it's not that easy to, to keep in touch with, uh, with the development. And the situation is, is pretty similar in explainability. So to find the right post hoc explainability algorithm that provides good explanations for, for my model, for my task and for my data, is fairly similar to finding a good machine learning algorithm. So the idea is that we can borrow some concepts from automated machine learning and basically use it to to, the, to find the right explainability algorithm that will provide good explanations for my problem. What is challenging about this part is this guy. Uh, the challenging about AutoXAI is how to define, how, how to compare different explainability algorithms and how to pick the right one for my task at hand. In other words, we need to answer the question, what's a good explanation? Many authors and many papers claim that a good explanation should somehow balance between two properties. These explanations should be understandable to humans. And also, which is maybe even more important, these explanations should faithfully describe how the model actually behaves so that, can, so that they can give us some additional insight into the models. Let's have a look at an example. Let's have an image classification task and let's explain the difference and what happens when understandability or fidelity are not in balance. So let's suppose that we have some decently trained neural network classifier and this neural network classifier classified this image on the left side as, as parrots. It was a correct classification because there are two parrots in the image and we also used postdoc explainability algorithm to get the explanation for this classification. In this case, there is the, the, the explanation is not balanced. It seems it is highly understandable because it, it looks quite pleasing. There are not too many, inf there is not too much information, there is no noise, there are some very well bounded regions on the parrot head. So I would say that the humans could understand this explanation. But the explanation lacks fidelity, which means that 
this particular explanation, although it looks pleasing, it looks pretty, it might be misleading. It probably misses some important details that, that uh, would describe how the model came to the conclusion that this is parrot. On the other hand, this explanation very well describes how the model decided. It contains all the information about the behavior of the model. It can give us more insights about the decision-making process. But on the other hand, it contains too much information for the humans to be comprehensible. So what we need to find is some kind of sweet spot between understandability and fidelity. OK, before we move on, uh, just a quick note. At Kinit, we wrote a pop block series on explainable AI, and we also covered the topic of evaluation of explainability. Uh, so if you would like, you are free to read it, and we will be glad for any, for any feedback. And just a teaser, the sixth part of the series is on the way. And now let's, let's get back to automated explainable AI. Again, the main goal is to find in some automatic way a good explainability algorithm that provides good explanations for my task at hand. So, by the way, sorry for the math. Uh, we define the AutoX AI as an optimization problem. Through optimization, we want to find an explainability algorithm X star and its hyperparameter lambda star. And, this exp and from this explainability algorithm, we want that it maximizes two sets of criteria. I, I would bet that you would guess what sets of criteria it would be. These criteria measure the quality of explanations with respect to the underlying model and underlying data, because they basically define our task. The first set of criteria is understandability. It basically measures how well the explanations generated by this guy, by this explainability algorithm, for predictions made by this model M, for input data D, how well this explanation corresponds to explanations that user would consider understandable. It's this epsilon guy. And we also have to balance this with the fidelity term. It means, uh, and this fidelity term basically take it, takes care of the fact that the explanations would faithfully describe the model's behavior. So this is the general concept. This is, let's call it the framework. And the only thing that it tells to you is that if you are looking in the, in the plethora of existing explainability methods for the right one, it should be understandable. And it is up to you to define what's understandable in your context and it should be faithful. That's it. Now, I would make a break and ask you if you have any questions right now, because I know it is quite a bunch of stuff that I already introduced. You can just yell it and I will repeat the question if you have some. Yeah. So my question is, uh, you mentioning a lot of examples uh, in, in image uh, recognition or uh, these tasks, and you also mentioned text. So uh, are these the prominent fields for explainable AI or what other fields uh, do you find that it's uh, being now um, researched actively? Thank you. Okay, so maybe the most prominent so far field so far is the vision because it is quite natural because you can visualize the explanations quite quite nicely. Also, the explainability is fairly extended in language. For instance, uh, with the new models like transformers, there are, there are some attempts to make them explainable as well. And also, there are attempts to apply explainability to multimodal processing, for instance, vision and language tasks. So the explainability is definitely not bound only to vision or to language. It is more bound to complex models themselves, regardless how they are used. But the application domains or the fields, branches of the AI are mostly vision and language and also multimodal. Okay, thank you for the question. I hope you enjoyed the break and now 
let's move to the last part of the presentation. So, as I mentioned, this one is a generic concept. It is a framework. What we did in our experiments is that we tried to bring a concrete implementation, a sample implementation, so that we can demonstrate the framework. And it looks like this one. So, our task was a classification one. Because some people from our NLP team have quite a strong vision background, one of the tasks that we addressed was vision. Concretely, we took a bunch of images from magnetic resonance, and we tried by using a decently simple neural network architecture VGG19 to classify these images into two classes. Either the image contains brain tumor or the patient is healthy. That's, that's our context, that's our task at hand. So, again, when we return to, to the framework, what we want to do is to basically provide explanations. So, when the VGG19 model cell tells me that on this MR image, the patient has brain tumor, I want to know why. Why the neural network's prediction was as it was. So, basically, I want to not find a good explainability algorithm. In particular, we wanted to find a configuration of a very particular explainability algorithm, which is called layer-wise relevance propagation. Maybe some of you know this algorithm. This is the LRP guy right here. So how this algorithm works? I will probably put here the puppy right here because in every presentation there has to be a puppy. So the LRP algorithm works like this. This image was classified by some arbitrary convolutional neural network as a dog. It is a correct classification, and also the confidence of the neural network was like this. This is basically the prediction, some floating point number, that the neural network predicted to me. What LRP does in the next step is that it takes the prediction, it takes the floating number 0 0.9, and it makes a, a recursive distribution of this number through the neural network from the output back to the input. In the finals, for every input feature, in this case, for every individual single pixel, we get some relevance score. And based on this relevance score, we can see that this picture was classified as a dog mostly because of the head of the dog, because of the pixels that represent the head of the dog. And this is the basic idea behind the LRP algorithm. This algorithm is highly configurable. And what the configuration means that the backward redistribution of the, of the output of the neural network is guided by so-called propagation rules. These are basically some mathematical formulas, do not bother with them, and on every single layer of the neural network we can apply different formula. These formulas basically tell us how the signal will be filtered on individual layers. For instance, we do not have to be interested in negative activations, because we want to know why it was classified as a dog and not why it was not classified as a goat. So we can do some magic on these layers. Uh, so what we want basically to find for our VGG19 architecture is the configuration of these LRP rules on individual layers. That's it. That's what we, what we want to find. To find this, we used an optimization algorithm we selected particles for optimization for some reasons. It is iterative bio-inspired optimization algorithm that works with particles. A single particle in our case is a specific configuration of the LRP. So basically, this algorithm tries multiple particles and selects the right one that provides best explanations for us. That's it. Again, just to just to remind you, we have VGG19 architecture, and on every single individual layer, we want to find the propagation rule that, when combined together, provides the best explanations. Here you can see a couple of different explanations for exactly the same prediction, exactly the same data point, and exactly the same model. And as you can see, this these explanations are very different from each other. All of them were, were produced by different configurations of the LRP algorithm. This is here just to illustrate how much the change of configuration of the same algorithm 
can provide the, can, can influence the explanation that you get. So the rightful question here is which LRP generates better explanations? And for this, we have the answer. We have to measure fidelity and understandability of these guys. Okay, so fidelity, in terms of measuring fidelity, we used quite a standard masking procedure, which works like this. We have input data and we have some prediction that there is a brain tumor here. And we have also the explanation mask that we got from some configuration of LRP. What we do during the masking procedure is this one. We take the pixels from the input data that were marked as the most relevant for the prediction and we remove them from the image. And we do it again and again and again, and we do it a couple of times. And every time when we remove the most relevant pixels, we make the inference through the neural network. And what we want to do from a good explanation is that when we remove the pixels that were the most relevant, the confidence of the model should drop drastically. In the second step, it should also drop, but not that drastically, and so on and so forth. And in the end, we can aggregate it to single single number. We can measure the area over this guy is called perturbation curve. So that's our fidelity measure just to have one concrete example. To measure understandability, this is more tricky because this is, this is yeah, let's keep it that this is more tricky. But the basic idea behind this is quite simple. Let's the user tell us how the user imagines a good explanation. So when we have a classification task that where the neural network has to tell about an image if there is a tumor or not, and the neural network tells me that, that there is a tumor in the image, well, I would expect that the neural network decided based on this region where the tumor is. So the basic idea is that we can make some overlap between the segmentation mask of the tumor and the, the explanation that we got from some explainability algorithm. We can quantify this in different ways, but basically it is an overlap. There are some formulas, but you can fa find them in the research paper. Uh, okay, and the last part of the whole pipeline is the optimization procedure. So for optimization, we used particle swarm optimization, which basically in multiple iterations work with particles, and in the end, one particle wins it all, and this is our explainability algorithm. In, uh, yeah. So PSO works with fitness function. In our case, it is composed of understandability and fidelity terms. And what we do is that we do not combine them directly. Why? Well, because measuring understandability is computationally cheap. It is basically some element-wise operation. Operations, it is basically measuring some overlap between two <laughs> two-dimensional arrays. That's it. But measuring fidelity is computationally like very expensive because for every individual data point, we have to make multiple backward and forward passes through the neural network and we, we have to do it for the whole data set. So it is computationally expensive. So what we do, we only evaluate understandability after every intermediate iteration and only evaluate the fidelity after the last iteration to select the final model, the final explainability algorithm. Okay, uh, I will probably skip this slide. You can find it in the paper because it is, we have already run out of time and I will skip to the summary. So to sum up, first of all, I would definitely like to thank Pontis Foundation and PwC for supporting our research on explainable AI. As far as explainability and trustworthy AI is concerned, in context of Kinit, these two guys are an integral part of three of our Horizon Europe projects. You can see them here. And what I like is that the explainability and trustworthiness is already projected into legislation changes. A nice example of it is the right to explanation, which was created on the field in, in the context of the European Union. And we, as a part of the project Hopero and European Digital Innovation Hub, our mission is to support the industry to be ready for also opportunities and challenges that are connected not only to the AI itself, but also to ethics and trustworthiness. 
So this is just for you to know that this project is aimed to help the industry to be ready for challenges connected to these guys. And last but not least, as far as our research is concerned, we are mostly focused on explainability of deep learning models. Uh, also very interesting from our point of view is the measuring of quality of explanations, which is probably the most unmatured field uh, in the context of explainable AI. And we are also developing this guy, the AutoX AI. Uh, last point that I would like to mention is that the explanations that, that what I'm personally looking forward to is the use of explanations in the disinformation combating. Why? Because current virtual space is filled with disinformation. And I personally be, believe that we do not only need to apply some artificial intelligence models and machine learning models to identify this information, but that there will be a huge need for explanations as well. Yeah, so that's basically it. Two more slides. Here you can find some interesting resources, two of them regarding explainable AI, two of them are GitHub repos. One of them is, well, quite, quite alive. This one is not that alive, but it still contains interesting resources. Here is a, a website of a very interesting joint project of Fraunhofer and Teo Berlin, which is considered with explainable AI. And also there is still our Kinit Poblock series on explainable AI, which is going to be extended in the nearest future. So that's it from my side. Thanks. Thank you, Martin, for explaining the explainable AI to us. And also thank you for the puppies and the parrots, because we need them, I, I think, in every presentation. I won't We've... give it to you, but... Okay. <laughs> Uh, we will now have a, a, like a very short break and right after the break we will get to the questions so don't worry everything will be answered. So uh, thank you so far for following with us and we are looking forward to your questions. Uh, I'll invite the guys over up here to, to answer your questions and while I'll be waiting for them, I'll just remind you that the next Better AI Meetup will be on the 22nd of February, which is in three months, and we already know what will, be, what will it be about. It will be about the usage of, of uh, synthetic data. Uh, we will have guys from Cognexa explain how they use synthetic data to auto-label their data sets, and we will also use synthetic data to train algorithms for fingerprint recognitions and other things. So basically synthetic data, not for uh, fake, uh, fake news, but for a greater good. And now guys, uh, we have quite a lot of questions. So we will first get to the cybersecurity probably. And uh, so we, have, we had quite a lot of questions about uh, using specific technologies, uh, Yurai. Um, so do you use uh, guns? Do you use and I, I don't mean like uh, shooting guns, I mean like uh, adversarial networks, so don't worry. Uh, do you use uh, transformers and do, uh, do you use uh, out of uh, box mm -hmm. machine learning models for uh, your, uh, for your uh, technologies? Okay, so for the out of the box models, uh, well, no, uh, we have everything our under, our, under uh, our control is reading the question. We will, uh, we will everything from the scratch on our data. It's not even running in any of the public cloud. We have our own. Uh, that's, uh, that's basically a specific thing in security, especially as in our case, we have a lot of uh, like business clients with very specific or very interesting uh, like demands. So uh, we typically do not rely uh, on 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 these on these uh, public uh, public clouds and their like models, uh, 
for the GANs, uh, generative adversarial networks. That's an, actually an interesting thing. We have we have it somewhere in our backlog, so when we don't have anything to do, we will we will maybe try it. But currently, it's not necessary because there is so much malware out out there, are so many new vulnerabilities that uh, the bad guys are supplying us that we don't need to do that. And for the uh, for the transformers, yes, we use them. Uh, I think pretty successfully. And uh, yes, as it was written in the end of question, uh, for sequential data precisely, and it's and it's uh, like really fine. Okay, and we also have uh, another question for you. How big a role? You mentioned the signatures, you know, mm -hmm. the the old school. How how big a role do they still play in modern cybersecurity? Can be <laughs> they sometimes completely replaced? Uh, I don't think so. That it could be replaced like entirely. They are still used in some way. For example, in our case, we are using it like for whitelisting or identifying stuff in our like um, cloud, uh, in the environment of of the users, uh, and they are good like for quick detection or whitelisting stuff and so on. And I think that it will not uh, not go anywhere. Can you get rid of the top two questions, please? And uh, since you are still here, do you, do you also use federated learning? It seems like a good idea because it's distributed over a vast number of computers. Uh, yes, it is a good idea, but actually to pull it out is extremely complicated. So currently it's just like in some, uh, uh, some form of an idea uh, for our use case. But yeah, it's a, uh, it's a, it's a great thing to, to actually, actually look at. Mm -hmm. uh, so just to just to switch a bit, uh, Martin, uh, how would you define actually fidelity if your input is a vector? I don't think there is a difference between what I showed uh, mm -hmm. defining fidelity for for images and for vectors, because in the end all of it are vectors. Just the dimensionality is changed. So what I would do, well, what could be the difference is how you actually mask out the most relevant features from your input vector. In case of images, it definitely doesn't make sense to mask out just one pixel because the change would be too small. What we usually do is that you take the most relevant pixel and then you also mask out some surrounding of it. Uh, the question is how can you mask it out? That's science on its own. Uh, in case of vectors, it depends on the dimensionality and on the size of the vector. If the vector is, for instance, of the length of 100, then it doesn't make that much sense to mask out that many features at once. Mm -hmm. Also, it depends on whether... Uh, so, so we can basically mask out just one feature from the vector and make the inference. Uh, also, it depends on whether the elements in the vectors that are next to each other uh, also depend on each other, whether there is some relation. In that case, yes, you can mask out multiple features at the same time. It makes sense to save you some computational resources, for instance. But otherwise, yeah, it depends on the situation. I hope I didn't confuse you that much, but the principle is very similar. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh... Uh, you're right. We're, we're actually getting a lot of security type <laughs> questions. Everybody's probably concerned about their computers and mobile phones, which is a good Thank thing. You. Yeah, do that. Uh, so, uh, how uh, uh, in uh, in uh, when when you use the machine learning models, how how can you tell like the malware behavior from a mere bug in legitimate software? You know, like for example, when you produce uh, some some uh, malware produces memory overflows on purpose. Some do it just by accident. How can you tell the difference? How can the model tell its uh, it difference, or how how do you train it? I assume from what you've mm -hmm. been talking about that you actually get a number of flags and then then you. But but how how to actually tell that you know it's it's malicious or just a bug? Uh. That's precisely what I what I showed there. Like it's a, it's it's not just about the machine learning. It's about all the other layers. Like for example, we have a special special part of our endpoint solution, uh, which is called uh, exploit uh, exploit blocker. And what it what it what it does is is not using machine learning. It's using other technologies to identify identify. Um, these kind of like bugs, like memory overflows, which processes is doing that, how it is, what data are in there. And 
in case that it identifies something, it uses also other detection layers, what I, what I described on the picture, and it might actually use uh, the ML approach just to identify that some process which is doing, uh, uh, doing for example, some, some uh, memory injection, whether, okay, so I ask the, uh, the machine learning part, is it good or is it bad or what do you think about it? So mm -hmm. it's like everything is interconnected together. Uh, the machine learning itself is not used to like uh, identify the, uh, the vulnerabilities. Oh, okay. Uh, can we get rid of the transformer question as well? Because we already answered it. And um, how effective is network micro segmentation for mitigating malware propagation? You know, uh, when, when you use uh, machine learning based detection. Uh, it doesn't necessarily uh, have to do anything with like machine learning based detection. Like generally, uh, it's a good approach. Like having segmentation in your network, uh, micro segmentation or anything. Uh, that's a good complement, like to all other stuff that are, that you are doing. Like uh, you can have like multiple la layers of uh, of uh, network segments uh, and. Uh, and uh, like uh, maybe several uh, several servers that are that are for the same purpose distributed in different networks and so on, and you still can get infected because I don't know uh, you have a vulnerable uh, uh, Active Directory server, or uh, you have a uh, you have a rogue insider who just came with the USB and and execute some uh, something malicious. So. Uh, it's like a complement. It's not like mm, th th these two things could work together, but also with other uh, other like um, things that are good to keep in mind when you are building your security. Yeah, and we'll still say we'll stay with security for one more questions, and that's you know one of the things that 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 uh, struck me as well that mm -hmm. once you dis distribute the models that you use actually to the endpoints aren't they then being used by you know cyber attackers and their guns for example to to actually understand how do you how you detect them uh well they are actually doing that like mm -hmm. that's, that's what the bad guys are still doing they are trying to evade our uh, our so uh, our protection it doesn't it doesn't necessarily have to be just about the machine learning part of it like generally the security software is not only the machine learning like there is the bunch of these layers and for example if the machine learning doesn't work in that time some other layers might catch it mm -hmm. or or for for some cases, uh, the machine learning is like useless because uh, the sample is extremely extremely protected, and we couldn't just look inside. So there are other like layers from the security that will actually step in, or multiple layers will will step in. So uh, and and like generally like using the the part of the machine learning model inside the endpoint security for adversarial input like to for example like poison poison our training that's extremely complicated because mm -hmm. in the vast majority um, uh, in the vast data that we are using uh the the like the feature engineering the cleanup of the uh of the data the labeling there's like 90 percent of the work that we are actually mm -hmm. doing so uh it will we'll actually spot it mm -hmm. so yeah, uh, I see. And uh, so, yes, so let's get back to uh, explainable AI. Uh, first, where do you actually see the need for explainable AI? It's, I mean, it's nice to know that how the, how, how, how the neural network actually decides about, for example, the, sh uh, the, the boats that you mentioned, but where do you see like the, the real need for it? Okay, I will borrow an example from the disinformation combating community. And just let's imagine that you are an administrator of, of some really big blogging platform or social networks. So your job is basically to remove this information or at least hide the disinformation so that it doesn't infect the population anymore. But so if the number of posts, comments or blogs is too huge, it's, it's quite natural that we want to use AI to detect this information. But for the administrator to be really able with, with confidence to remove some some uh, some disinformative con content he has to be sure that it is really a disinformation and here explainability can really help because for instance let's have a forum where there are like thousands of new posts every hour from this thousand of po from this thousand posts 50 are labeled by the AI as disinformative 
So this definitely helps. The administrator doesn't have to scan through 1,000, but through 50. But 50 is still too much. So what can help is that the administrator doesn't have to read uh, the whole posts that were marked as disinformative, but only the parts that the explainability highlighted as those parts of the text that were disinformative. So this, for instance, can be of real use to no, of real use to administrators in the real world mm -hmm. use case. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and yeah. and of course another nice use case is to find to identify flaws in the models and to debug models. Mm -hmm. This is more for like researchers, not mm -hmm. for the end user, but it is definitely another use case. Yeah, and we have maybe a connected questions: how to actually create an understandable explanation uh, for. Uh, the, for example, segmented ter uh, tumor. Yeah, so, so the question is about the huge formula this, what, that was yeah. there about the epsilon. Uh, it really depends on the use case, but in such a scenario, let's have an image classification task and we only have labels and we want to, to understand how understandable the explanations are, you can always use users. Mm -hmm. It doesn't have to be fully automatic. For instance, you can make the explanations by three different explainability algorithms and let these explanations uh, be evaluated by the end user, mm -hmm. preferably by some expert. If we stick with the medical domain, uh, we already actually had some experience with showing explanations to doctors, and there was quite a gap between our understanding of explanations and theirs. So it is really necessary to sometimes, at least, to show the explanations to the end users. So the the answer is that the epsilon in this case could quite easily be a human element. Okay, and while we are at it, uh, we are obviously getting back to the Fisher vector model and comparing with CNN. Uh, it's if we understand that you know the the, the understandability is uh, defined as an overall with ide ideal area. What about that Fisher vector model that was just you know guessing basically basic based on the fact that there's water. This is actually a totally great question because it comes to the roots, to the chicken and egg problem. And I will explain it before I answer the question. Mm -hmm. To be able to tell that the model decides on unreasonable input features, so it doesn't work logically, although it can achieve reasonable accuracy based on some noise in the data, to discover this hidden flaw in the model, we need explainability. But to be sure that the explanations are good, we have to have a reasonably behaving model. So this is chicken and egg. Mm -hmm. uh, in this particular case, when I simplify this, what would happen? Uh, let's say that we would have segmentation masks of the boats. So from the understandability point of view, we would like to, the relevance to be concentrated in the boat. In case of the Fisher vector, the understandability score would be very low. So if we only selected the explainability algorithm based on this score, we would be fooled because the explainability algorithm would place the would play it the relevance where we would like it to have, <laughs> but it would fool us about the real behavior of the model. And therefore, we have to somehow balance between the fidelity because in this case, okay, so the understandability would be low, but the fidelity would be very high. Mm -hmm. So in this case, I would guess that we would basically discover all, the, even without looking at the images, hidden flaws in the image, mm -hmm. uh, uh, hidden flaws in the models. In the models. Okay. Uh, before we uh, before we answer the, the 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 questions here, do we have uh, someone in the audience? We uh, I just remind you that we have uh, two microphones. So if you have something to ask, yeah. <laughs> I have a question for both of you, but uh, first for as a security question, um, do we know about the balance of computational cost be, uh, between using algorithms to create malware and then to process malware? Is it possible that we could get into uh, a point where the algorithms are so sophisticated and it's more of a computational arms race? And do we have a chance to possibly win that? Uh, I think that currently uh, the situation is a little bit on our side. Uh, but I, I wouldn't say that it will stay for long. Uh, the thing is that still right now there is like a lot of uh, non-machine learning ways uh, how to create a lot of malware. 
Uh, and there are a lot of machine learning ways how to fight it. Uh, but it will definitely change in some time. So yeah, it will be like War of the Machines or something like that. Especially if probably some state players get involved because they do have the access to computer oh, yes. power. Yeah. And then, uh, then for Martin, um, I also wanted to ask you about uh, negative activations and uh, how important that can also be um, in looking into understandability. Um, in a sense, like I think as humans, we want to look at the positive activations. It makes more sense to us. But even ruling things out is also like a, is a reasonable way to uh, make decisions, right? Yep, definitely. For instance, here we had a, an example with classification of brain tumors. Here, negative relevance doesn't make and it's not that much sense because the <coughs> fact that in one part of the brain there is no brain tumor <laughs> doesn't tell anything about that it can be in another part of the brain. On the other hand, we also made experiments, and it is also covered in, in the paper, I hope there is some reference. We made experiments with classification also of MR images, but in this case, we, we distinguished between Alzheimer's disease patients and healthy individuals. And in this case, the fact that the, that the patient was not classi classified as having Alzheimer's disease, here we are also interested in negative relevance because we know from medical perspective that there are some parts of the brain that are strongly related to Alzheimer's disease, for instance, lateral ventricles and so on. And if the patient was not classified as Alzheimer's disease, it could be interesting to know why he was not classified like that. So these are, well, these are basically two types of tasks. One is distinguishing betwe between two classes, and one is detection of presence of one class. Thank you. Uh, do we have another question here? If not, we can just continue uh, here, but uh, feel free to raise your hand whenever. Uh, Martin, can explanations be used to produce a number or a metric when comparing two models, similarly to basically the outputs of ML models? Well, I would need more, more information, so I, I would just guess that you are asking whether it, there, that the number would not tell me something about the explanations themselves, but about some accuracy of the model, or yeah, probably maybe if it's so if if it's if it's one one model has a higher one explanation has a higher relevance probably than the other. Okay, so right now no metric connected directly to the accuracy or something like that comes to my mind. But what comes to my mind is what was already on the slides. And it is when we want to estimate how well the model will behave on unseen data, then we can use these numbers, for instance, the fidelity and, and, and mostly maybe the understandability, if you are able to calculate it, to distinguish if the model decides on based on relevant, relevant features. Mm -hmm. So we can, there is quite a nice example that there was also image classification task and the model also found some hack in the data and it found out that class horses often in the training set, these images had a watermark. Mm -hmm. So the relevance was almost exclusively uh, concentrated on the watermark. And in this case, if we were able to evaluate the understandability, in this case, I would bet that the understandability for this class would be pretty low. So we would definitely find some bug in the data. <laughs> and even though we do not have this quite expensive like segmentation masks of regions where the, where the relevance should be concentrated, we can use some indirect measures. For instance, there are, like with the boats, with the Fisher vector, we can make some assumes about the model based on whether, for instance, the relevance is not only exclusively concentrated in one part of the image. Mm -hmm. If it is, well, then the model would be doomed in the practice mm -hmm. because it would be at least not translationally invariant. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Uh, okay, we have this. And now we're going back to the security again <laughs> because there's there's a lot of security-minded people. So does entropy play a role in your approach to detecting attacks, you right? Uh, entropy is very tricky, uh, but actually, yeah, it plays some, some role, but not a really significant one, but uh, it's like a part of those, uh, those features that, that, that we use. Uh, 
Okay, so do you have some machine learning models or, you know, sets of models <coughs> that are specifically applicable to detecting and combating uh, some types of cyber threats? Mm, yes. Uh, for example, what I showed uh, also in the in the presentation, uh, the unsupervised learning approach for UFI, because, the, for example, issue with the, with the UFI is that you have, like, a huge amount of clean stuff, but only a tiny portion of malicious stuff. So obviously the uh, the approach with some supervised approach now nah, wouldn't be playing really good. So mm -hmm. uh, for example, but also there are other models that we are uh, like what I showed. Uh, that's also an ensemble of a lot of models plus deep learning and so on. And even the deep learning have uh, it's not like just one model, but several of them. And uh, some of them are uh, uh, better to identify, I don't know, uh, malicious, uh, maliciousness of, uh, uh, of um, uh, code written in, in C Sharp or something like that. Mm -hmm. So a lot of them are specific. Yeah, so there is, there is uh, like a lot of specific uh, models. Uh, okay, thank you. Uh, which type of data do you analyze the most often? Are there logs or snippets of code what 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 do you actually get sent you know from all over the world from the end mm, that's a, that's a complex question uh typically it's some kind of metadata and uh and the samples itself like the binaries mm -hmm. the scripts and so on so mm -hmm. this is like the input and uh, from what i described there we create like this uh uh, this feature vector, which which we call DNA, and use it for multiple purposes. So these are like typical things that we are looking at. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. And now we have a question for Martin. We also have a question whether you can get the slide. Uh, there will be there will be a, um, there will be a recording of all of this uh, on YouTube, and you can probably get a slide. We'll we'll get back to that, uh, but we will see. But you you know you should just visit and you should just see everything. You know, just don't, don't just rely on on getting sent uh, the PowerPoints. So, uh, but uh, anyway, uh, for Martin and I, now I have to read the question because. I don't really understand it, so I'll just put the words in. What is your opinion about explainable AI baseline based methods, for example, integrated gradients? Mm -hmm. Does it make sense to optimize it with regards to the baseline? That's a tough one. Um, I don't really have a strong opinion on this. <laughs> uh, well, I will start from the. Me neither, actually. <laughs> from other corner. Uh, Last week, I actually had a quite nice talk with a guy from Netherlands about explainability. He just finished his PhD, and he's, for instance, not a fan of of uh, relevance attribution methods. Uh, so I believe that the the answer to this question would be quite opinionated, or I didn't understand the question quite well, <laughs> but I don't have strong opinion on that. Sorry for that. And which means that you can, you know, discuss over uh, over uh, drinks and uh, and uh, you know and some refreshments, which we will have shortly because we just run out of questions. Uh, uh, thank you, guys, both for visiting us. It's been most uh, interesting because you see that we had a lot of questions for you, and it's been uh, it's been uh, quite uh, ex exhausting, but we exhausted them all. So <laughs> I'm uh, I'm very glad. Uh, I'll be seeing you. Ah, oh, sorry, we have a question from the audience. Yes. Yeah, well, apologies for 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 being late. Uh, <laughs> I just have a couple of questions we haven't answered. A previous attempt okay <laughs> so oh yeah yeah right yes so the first question for for uh, for your eyes so you mentioned the domain knowledge so I just wanted to ask how you leverage it in your unsupervised learning algorithm specifically uh, domain knowledge is that uh, for doing this stuff uh, you need to have the understanding uh, understanding of the thread landscape and for that uh, you need to do a lot of reversing, uh, uh, reverse engineering, which means that you actually have the compiled binary, or you are looking at it uh, through disassembly and so on. And uh, to actually get the hands on, like you need to analyze like thousands of the samples to actually get some, get, uh, get, get the knowledge that you need to build this stuff. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks and for, for Martin. Uh, again, about unsupervised learning. So my question is, what are the current trends on explainability in this kind of domain? Okay, uh, 
I'm mostly concerned, about, not concerned, but I'm mostly focused on supervised learning. So I really don't feel that that competent to answer this question. I'm not, I'm not, uh, well, at home in the trends of in unsupervised learning and explainable AI. Right. Thanks so for that. Okay, thank you. Do we have uh, some more questions from the audience? Yeah, so... so uh, but if not, I would just grab the chance to yeah. ask you, right? You mentioned that you you are tackling the problems of adversarials that you get from, from the bad guys. Mm -hmm. uh, do you also somehow, well, examine the behavior of the neural networks or, or of the models themselves uh, to detect these adversarials? Well, not really. <laughs> well, we try, but uh, it's it's hard. And uh, yeah, you have the whole presentation about it. Like doing doing explainability, uh, it's hard. So um, we typically look on on the output, like whether the output is desired. In this case, like uh, whether the ratio between the detection of the malicious stuff and clean stuff is like reasonable uh, to like put it into the production. Okay, so what comes to my mind, it doesn't have necessarily have to be connected to the explainability, but we made some experiments with analyzing of the activations inside the neural networks. Mm -hmm. And the assumption was that for for the data that are in the distribution with those on which the neural network or any arbitrary model was trained, will cause activations that will be similar to to the training data. And when there is some adversarial example, then there could be some small but detectable, well, not change, but, but mm -hmm. difference between these activations. So, Yeah, I understand. Uh, well, uh, we try to look uh, about what is like the most important features or what, what is like the most important uh, uh, like weight or feature in uh, which, uh, which is, uh, which is, uh, influencing the result so we are trying to identify it and use this like to improve the model like whether there is not some some buggy behavior that uh, the attention is on some part where it shouldn't be mm -hmm. because when you when you have when you look at it from the perspective i don't know of the disassembly of the code it doesn't make sense right mm -hmm. uh, and we then we try to like uh, change the parameters in a way that it will be focused on the part which is like more more important or which is giving like more sense uh, f for the neural network to be targeted. That, that's something that we tried, but again, it's, uh, it's like really uh, time extensive task because with so many data and parameters and so on, it's like really tricky. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Martin, for stealing my job and for your <laughs> for your presentation. Uh, thank you, Uri, and thank you all for coming. Uh, I would also like to thank Kinit, uh, HubHub, Innovatrix, and Tatra Banka for making this happen. And we'll be seeing each other on the 22nd of February next year, and we will be talking about synthetic data. So I'm looking forward to you. Thank you very much, and uh, see you uh, see you uh, behind the curtains. Goodbye. <laughs>